Okay, this video is going to be a book review. The name of the book is uh, Martin Luther by Eric Metaxas. So Martin Luther by Eric Metaxas. Metaxas is a good writer. You know, he's uh, clever. He's kind of funny. Uh, he's a big fan of Luther. Okay, I'm not such a big fan of Luther. I'm a Catholic, and I think Luther screwed up. Okay, but I can understand why uh, people with, you know, German ancestry they love Luther. All right, uh, we're gonna, the Luther is very interesting. He was uh, out of all the Christians that ever lived, he's the second most famous one, most written about after Christ, um, and he was very much of. Uh, into drama. Okay, so here's the most famous scene from Luther's life here. And this is that the Diet of Worms where he had to meet before the Emperor Charles V. And the standard question for Luther is, will you recant? Yes or no? Will you revoke what you have said criticizing the Pope and the Catholic Church um, and the sale of indulgences, for example? And Luther made his famous speech uh, he had earlier said, a simple layman with scripture is superior to the Pope and his counsels without scripture. If I am shown my error, then I will be the first to throw my books into the fire. Um, at the actual uh, Diet of Worms, his books were on a table next to the uh, area where he was uh, interrogated. He said, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Amen. Martin Luther. Okay, so quite dramatic. Quite entertaining. Um, and now this led to a big split. It basically split all of Christendom. And the big two divisions are Catholic and Protestant. There's, of course, you know, Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox. There's Russian Orthodox. Yeah, sure. But... We're going to talk, and this is a funny scene from the Bart Simpson show where basically Marge, when she died, she went to heaven and she was accidentally sent to Protestant heaven. But Bart and uh, Homer were in uh, Catholic heaven and she looked over across the clouds and they looked like they were having a lot more fun. And that actually tells you a lot about the difference between Protestant and Catholic. Okay, here's Luther's parents, and his father was a pretty successful guy in the mining industry, and he wanted Luther to become a lawyer to help with the family business. And Luther initially went to law school, but then something happened, and he dropped out. Luther was coming home in a storm, and there was terrible lightning and thunder, and he thought he was going to die. And he, he had been thinking about going into becoming an Augustinian monk, and when the lightning struck real close to him, he said, Yes, St. Anne, I will do it. I will become a monk. And he became a monk. His father is not happy about that. And Luther was really kind of a my way or the highway, all or none. And he reminded me of Savonarola. So this is Girolamo Savonarola of um, you know Florence in Italy in the late uh, 1400s, around 1500. And basically, he pissed off the Medici's, and he ended up not doing so well. Uh, Luther ended up coming out of things okay, and the big difference is Savonarola did not have the political support of his community. Uh, he had the support of the people, but that really doesn't matter much compared to the rulers. Um, so Savonarola got pushed out. And Machiavelli had made that observation that without support, a prophet doesn't go far. The big guy who was pissing off Martin Luther was this guy right here, Tetzel. Tetzel was a representative of the Catholic Church, and he's a very good salesman to promote the sale of indulgence. And the Catholic Church at that time really wanted indulgence and needed the money. It had a lot of things going on. It was in conflicts with other uh, states. And it also wanted to rebuild the Vatican and, and make all kinds of art, you know, paint the, wall, the roof of the Sistine Chapel and whatnot. So Tetzel was a big salesman of indulgence. And so you can imagine he did not like Luther. Luther had been more and more annoyed what he thought was an abuse with these indulgences. So, you know, in 1517, he nailed his 95 theses, his 95 questions for debate in Latin on the church door at Wittenberg. Okay, and, you know, they have him glamorously doing with a hammer. He probably taped it in real life, but it's much more glamorous that he hammered it to the door. And then he met with the other men. And the church was in the center of the community in those days. And um, Luther walking away from it. So this was sort of a... Initially, what started out as a minor event became a bigger event. Here's the doors of the Church of Wittenberg nowadays. It had burned down, and they rebuilt it, and they inscribed his theses into the door now. Um, 
Okay, so Martin Luther continued to write things that were very popular. There was no copyright in those days, so the printers would actually get the money for selling anything that someone had written. And Martin Luther's writings started to spread around Germany, and the literate people read them. You know, most of the people are literate, but the literate ones read them, and they sided with Martin Luther. A lot of the Germans were pissed off because they saw their money going to Rome, and they felt they didn't really get much for it. They felt, in a sense, they were being sort of tax or looted, if you will. And so Martin Luther then, uh, the, the Pope sent a papal bull telling Martin Luther he had to recant or he'd be excommunicated. And, and Martin Luther basically told the Pope to shove it. He took the papal bull and he had it burned. Um, and he did this as a public event, a big drama. And there is uh, Martin Luther burning the papal bull. And this was really, you could say, sort of crossing the Rubicon, meaning like Julius Caesar when he had crossed the Rubicon to take a step uh, from which there was no turning back. So this is a big famous event. There's tons of paintings of Martin Luther burning the papal bull. And this is just a painting of Caesar, Julius Caesar, crossing the Rubicon to come back into Rome. And it was considered an act of treason, and it was a big deal. And so likewise, for Luther to burn the papal bull, uh, it meant that he was not going to be able to reconcile, most likely, with um, Rome. Okay, uh, so the printing press had, you know, come out in like the 1450s, and it was now uh, able to spread Luther's writings relatively quickly. And amongst the educated folk, Luther was quite popular. Like I said, they felt that Rome was taking their money, that the peasants were being tricked into giving the little money they had up for indulgences. And they saw Luther as, in a sense, it was a nationalistic thing. He was supporting the rights and interests of Germany as he saw it. And some people will say that Luther was a bit of a tool of the princes of Germany. Because the princes, they loved all of this. And, you know, a lot of them did. Not all of them did, but a lot of them for the reason that it empowered them. And we'll, we'll come back to that later. Okay, here's just another picture of of a Luther, and I kind of joke that a peasant with scripture knows more than the Pope without it, Luther had said, and I would say a health coach with a low-fat vegan diet can help more people with chronic uh, Western diseases in the head of Harvard Hospital without it. Okay, so continuing on with the story of Luther. So here's Charles V, and he was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which is basically most of what we call Europe today. And he had a lot of responsibilities, trying to hold everything together. And there were the Turks were encroaching on the margins of the Holy Roman Empire, and he wanted the population to be united so they could stand up to the Turks. Okay, A lot of them were afraid that there was going to be a takeover of Europe by the Turks. Okay, so they had Martin Luther's books out on the table at the Diet of Worms uh, when he was asked again to recant. And first of all, he said, which book should I recant? If I am shown my error, then I will be the first to throw my books into the fire. And then as I had read it before, he said, here I stand, I can do no other. Quite dramatic. Okay, now how did Luther make it? The reason Luther made it, because he had the support of Frederick the Wise, who was an elector, meaning a big shot in what was what is Germany now, but in the area of Germany. Back then, it wasn't at all a unified place. And basically, he protected Luther. After the Diet of Worms, um, Charles V, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, had declared Luther a, um, a heretic, and he wanted Luther to be burned at the stake. But Frederick the Wise hid him in Wartburg, Wartburg uh, Castle, and that was a special time for Luther. Luther, during that time, he translated the... Uh, New Testament into German, into the vernacular, so all the German people could read it. Luther was a very intelligent guy. He had a doctorate, you know, a PhD in theology. Um, and so he, he had also worked with a translation from Erasmus. Erasmus was a brilliant guy of these times as well. While he was hiding out in Wartburg, he was sort of being a knight, and they call him Junker means knight, and George was just sort of the, the name they gave him, Junker George. So you can see he's growing a big beard, he's got a lot of hair, rather than having his typical monk ton tonsure, just mean a little circular bit of hair like a halo around your head, and he had previously as an Augustinian monk. And Luther was very foul-mouthed. He was constantly swearing and making scatological jokes, you know, about farts and feces. And this is not even like one of the worst things. This is a typical 
thing Luther would say when he's pissed about something. And he's pissed at the Pope. He called the Pope the Antichrist. And he said, may God punish you. I say you shameless, barefaced liar, devil's mouthpiece who dares to spit out before God, before all the angels, before the dear son, before all the world, your devil's filth. He would go on and on like that. Vulgar. And so, I mean, he was kind of entertaining because if you ever read a lot of Christian writers, most of them are boring. Most of them are lightweights. So it's nice, you know, when somebody comes along and they're entertaining. You know, I don't agree with a lot of things Luther said, but he was entertaining. You know, and I really liked Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, for example, is one of the better Christian writers about Christianity type. There's a lot of Christians that are great writers, but not as directly when they write about theology. You know, the greatest writers who ever live are Christian. Come on. Greatest novel ever written, Charles Dickens, Christmas Carol. Second best novel ever written, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Third best novel is Brothers Karamazov by um, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Fourth best novel, Quo Vadis by uh, Enric Siemkiewicz. Okay, so they're awesome writers, but when, they, when, you, when it comes, when it's a theologian, a Christian theologian, most of them are painfully boring, okay? Luther was anything but boring. You know, he'd been described by Will Durant, the great historian, as Luther is the most vituperative theologian that ever lived. And that sounds like a fair statement. Now, here's a guy who I actually like better than Luther. This is Erasmus, okay? Erasmus was kind of clever, kind of funny, but Erasmus wanted the church to stay together. Luther really didn't care. Luther was sort of my way or the highway, not willing to compromise on anything, and he was a bright guy, and he meant well in his own way, but Luther really had no control over the Reformation. Even though he sort of started the ball rolling down the hill, Luther could not control things. And right from the beginning, things got crazy with the Reformation. Erasmus would have tried to reconcile things. I, I actually see things more like Erasmus than like Luther. Um, even though people think Erasmus was a bit of a wimp at times, yeah, maybe, but a Luther was an over-the-top hothead um, and that had major, major consequences. We're going to talk about that. Okay, like one of the first things that happened, this didn't take long. There was a, a war in uh, Germany, a civil war, and, you know, Luther was supposed to be the friend of the peasants. Well, guess what? 80,000 German peasants were killed because of Luther's Reformation. And not only that, Luther went with the princes. Okay, so Luther had to sort of, you know, kiss butt to the princes because without Frederick's protection, he himself would be burnt as a heretic but Luther, you know, wrote letters urging the princes to brutally put down the peasants. So, you know, there's really the friend of the little guy, you know, having 80,000 peasants wiped out. Okay, and some of the problems were Luther's colleagues, his former colleagues, Karlstadt and Munzer, were stirring up the peasants. All right, and you can see that's not going anywhere good. Um, and kind of the point I'm making here is these are guys who knew Luther and had much in common with Luther. And right from the beginning, they're stirring up all kinds of things that Luther did not want. And, you know, Karlstadt was saying, we need to get all this idolatry out of the churches. We need to destroy all the paintings, destroy all the sculptures. It's very iconoclastic, destructive. And um, there's a lot of people, myself included, who think it was just ridiculous. Uh, they destroyed all kinds of paintings. Um, they destroyed the sculpture. There was a lot of things about Protestant that I think are really bad. Um, and here's another typical thing that comes out of Protestantism. Um, Charles V was trying to stir up allegiances, get everybody aligned to help him fight the Turks, and he was pissed off the Pope was, the Pope was kind of aligning with France, and he actually sacked Rome, Charles V. And Luther would say things like, even though Charles V hates me, God is forcing him to go after the Pope in my defense. Okay, so all this craziness. And so Charles V sort of claimed, oh, I didn't really sack Rome in 1527. It was mostly his Lutheran soldiers, the Germans. They went in and they just brutalized Rome. Okay, the nuns were R-A-P-E-D. The priests were killed. Many of the other people were killed, about 12,000 people. Rome previously was sort of the wealthy cultural center of the world, it, of, the, of the known civilized world of that time. And, you know, you had the Renaissance. You're right now in, you know, high Renaissance, okay? All the magnificent stuff being done in the Renaissance. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And they destroyed it. You know, Nietzsche, Will Durant, and many others have said Luther destroyed the Renaissance. Luther put an end to the Renaissance. Luther and his Reformation. It was a disaster, okay? They destroyed Rome, the greatest city in the world, all right? It went from a population of 55,000 down to about 10,000, okay? And of the people who weren't killed, many fled, and it was just 
the destruction of Rome. So, you know, and the Pope had been stupid. He should have paid more attention to Luther. You know what they should have done? They should have had Luther work out his own little order. Like, you've got the Dominicans, you've got the Franciscans, the Cistercians, the Benedictines. You could have had the Lutheran order of the Catholic Church. That would have been so much better. Luther then went and got uh, married. He married a nun. So this is a former nun, uh, Katerina von Bora. And her and a bunch of nuns escaped from their convent. The Nemtian nuns is what they were called. And they then they then all had to marry them off. And her and Luther got married. Okay, what did Luther do that was good? Well, I think it's good that Luther got married in the sense that I think priests should be allowed to be married. That's one of the reasons why... The priesthood in the Catholic Church right now are in a major disaster because they don't allow married men to be priests, okay? It's ridiculous. You got all these low IQ uh, Catholic priests that stink. They're totally boring, okay? That's a big reason why men don't go to church very much because they're bored out of their mind with these low IQ weasels that tend to be the preachers in a, in a Catholic church. Um, if, you, if they allowed married men, they get a lot more intelligent, sophisticated guys. Back in these days, you know, 1500s, People would have families with 10 kids, and it wasn't a big deal to send one of your sons to the to be a priest. But nowadays, people only have one or two kids, and they want their son having some grandchildren. They don't want him going to be a priest. All right, so anyways, they, you know, they can't recruit much. They don't have much of a, a talent pool to recruit from, and they get, you know, there's some exceptions, but in general, they're not good. I mean, that's why you don't have any good theologian Catholic writers, all right? All right, so anyways, here was something good that Martin Luther did as well. He wrote uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and um, you know he wrote both the music and the words to it. So Luther was a pretty talented guy. He could play the flute, and he was a pretty talented musician. Um, and it's a nice hymn. It's a nice hymn. Like so many hymns, it comes out of sadness. You know, Luther had some sad experiences too, like his daughter died and stuff, and a lot of the, some, several of his friends were martyred okay, during the conflicts after uh, the early phase of the Reformation. Oh, one of the things I'll give the Re Reformation guys credit for, in general, I think Catholics are pretty superior in art to Protestants. The Protestants did have an awesome set of artists in the 1800s, and that came out of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. I've given other lectures on <clears throat> the artistic movement of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood with John Ruskin, and that was an interesting time. It was sort of the Victorian age in England, but there was more to it. There was also at that time a Catholic Renaissance in England to some extent, Sometimes it's called the Tractarian Movement after John uh, Cardinal Henry von Neumann. But, um, you know, The Christmas Carol is the greatest novel ever written. Here, here's just one quick quote, for, and that's what I loved about Charles Dickens. He was an awesome writer of the English language. Okay, well, I won't even go into it, but I, I love Scrooge and The Christmas Carol. I think it's the greatest book ever written, the greatest novel ever written. Okay, here's just a lovely picture of it. You know, Tiny Tim lives because Scrooge changes his ways and helps out Bob Cratchit, his employee, and... The whole thing was great, and it was beautiful, and, you know, that's how humans should live, how they should be, helping each other. Everybody benefits. And the difference is, in the theology, you know, I don't think they're that big of a deal. I'm not dogmatic at all. I think, you know, the basic principles, you got the Ten Commandments, you got the words of Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, be nice to each other, love each other, help each other, all of that is good, and that's what it should be. You don't need to be arguing about all the stupid stuff. The, the Protestants, you know, right from the beginning, they couldn't agree on things as simple as, like, what is the communion wafer? You know, Luther said, it is God itself. And Zwingli said, no, no, it is only God metaphorically. And because of that, they couldn't get along and they couldn't reconcile. And that's what happens with Protestants. It keeps breaking apart into more and more groups. The Catholic Church is still intact, even though the current pope is the Antichrist. It's still intact since, you know, founded by Christ and St. Peter, all right, versus Protestantism keeps splintering nonstop. It's, there's like 30,000 different Protestant sects in the modern world. just want to make one point, too, about Catholicism. It's, you know, because the church always has some problem that needs to be reformed. But, man, they should get credit for the things they do, too. Look, at here's Amiens uh, Cathedral in France. The best cathedrals are in France. And just look how magnificent it is. It's beyond beautiful. These are the most beautiful, best buildings ever made in the history of the world. And if you actually study history and science and architecture and anything aesthetic or beautiful or good, you will see that Catholicism leads the way. There's nothing even close to it. Look how magnificent and beautiful the three doorways, you know, the past, present, and future, the path into heaven, um, all these little statues, 
the priests, the nuns, the, the other heroes of the, of the church. And it gives you good role models. That's why I say, you've heard me say it before, psychology, modern psychology is a joke. The psychology of Christianity is much better than the psychology of uh, modern psychology. I mean, you ask them, they can't even tell you the difference between a man and a woman. They can't give you an example of how to behave. The Christian church can immediately say, be like Christ, be like the saints, okay? It's easy, it's obvious. Okay, and then here's part of that whole um, Catholic Renaissance in um, in England in the 1800s. Let me see if I can get this picture out of the way. And this guy, Augustus Welby Pugin, was a magnificent architect. architect and uh, just here's some of the things he said. He said, Gothic today, Gothic tomorrow, Gothic forever. Gothic cathedrals are the most best buildings in the world by far. Gothic is the only appropriate style for building of a Catholic church. Everything glorious about English churches is Catholic. Everything debased and hideous is Protestant. That's a fair statement. Gothic is about light and color and beauty and splendor with soaring lines that lift the human spirit heavenward. The heaven-pointing spire is a beautiful and instructive emblem of a Christian's brightest hopes. Since I was a child, I have prayed for the restoration of the long-lost glory of Catholic England. Yeah, we're going to talk about that too. So what happened to Catholic England, okay? Now here's just one thing I want to show you. This is a typical Catholic church. At the altar, there'll be some magnificent, beautiful painting and beautiful sculptures. You know, something from the life of Christ. And there's the Trinity as well. Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, okay, is symbolized by a dove. Um, they're magnificent, and, and everything is sort of clear. You know, there's the, the land level of mankind, there's the level of the angels, the spirits the, in, in heaven and whatnot. Um, all that stuff is beautiful. Okay, now here's like a Protestant church in comparison. There's no paintings, it's kind of bleak, it's kind of austere, um, and, and the whole story is going to get even worse than that. Here's a, a painting by... Uh, Dirk van Dellen, and this is iconoclasm of the Protestants. The Protestants went in there like a bunch of hotheads, and they destroyed the Catholic churches. They tore down the statues. They would pull the statues down from their um, embankments and destroy them. Here's another destroyed church. They would destroy the paintings. They would. They took the Celtic crosses of the Irish and threw them into the sea. It's just destructive. Okay, this is idolatry. Idolatry. And, you know, I agree with Alfred North Whitehead. He said the, the Protestant Reformation is one of the biggest disasters in the history of the world, okay? I do think Luther meant well initially, but he wasn't able to foresee the consequences of his behavior, and it just led to massive destruction and death and mayhem, okay? So this is just sort of Europe after the Reformation. What you'll see here is that, you know, parts of Germany became Lutheran. Lutheran is sort of the pinkish color. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, a lot of these places became Lutheran. Um, then there was Calvinism, and Calvinism here, we got it in the purple. Parts of Switzerland um, and a few other places, parts of Scotland, of course, and the Netherlands. Um, and then also you had the Anglican Church, which later developed, uh, the that being the name of it. That wasn't the name of it initially in England. Um, the Huguenots were Protestants also. They went into France, for example. They're sort of most famously known for that. And already, very quickly, Protestant splinters into a whole bunch of different sects. They can't hold it together. They're always arguing. And one of the worst things about Protestantism is, like, just take for in England, okay? Henry VIII wasn't allowed to get another divorce by the uh, or annulment by the Catholic Church. So that's one of the big reasons why he wanted Protestantism to come into England. And then he just declared himself the head of the church. So this is a guy who had eight wives and bumped off, you know, like about half of them. All right. That's the head of the Protestant church. Okay. I mean, is that a joke or what? See, that's what happens with Protestantism is that when you have a disagreement between, when you have a disagreement between, the people within a country about religion, and it's a big disagreement that's sustained and they can't come to terms with it, then the secular ruler has to intervene. And what ends up happening is the secular ruler just takes everything over. Okay, so, you know, what kind of a church is going to be run by Henry VIII? It's a joke, okay? He's a big fat jerk who, you know, bumps off his wives, all right? He's, that's, he's not a religious man, okay? What you want is a church that's separate from the authorities so you have a, something to appeal to, that you have some rights and things 
that are that are not secular. Okay, this lady right here, Elizabeth Lev, wrote a real nice book called "How Catholic Art Saved the Faith." Okay, and I like the book. It's especially about the painters. And like I said, the Catholic Church has so much tradition and history. It goes right back to Christ. All the Protestant churches were started by an individual man. Whereas the Catholic Church goes all the way back to Jesus, you know, with he said, you know, to St. Peter, you're the rock upon which I shall build my church. And the Catholic Church, it also has a lot of respect for the ancients. It learns from other cultures. It learns from the ancient Greeks and the Romans. It's called syncretism. Syncretism means that you can learn from other cultures and take their wisdom and incorporate it into your own daily business. Catholicism welcomes everybody. Anybody who wants can just snap their fingers and say, I want to be a Catholic, okay? There's no... All you got to do is say, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God, I want to be a Catholic. Okay, there's no big deal fuss about it. You know, and because of that, you're going to have lots of stupid people. But, you know, it's not about intelligence or smarts, and it welcomes everyone. Everyone is welcome in the Catholic Church. It's, that's what Catholic means. It means universal church, that everybody's welcome. It also provided a nice structure to the community and people's lives. You know, you've got the, the saints' days, the feast days. It'd be nice to have a week, a day off every week in addition to the weekend. Um, lots of educational art to teach all the illiterate peasants about the history of the Bible and everything else related to it, Christianity. And it's also very inspiring to the smartest people. I like the way the, the master painters and sculptors and builders, they all competed to make the best masterpiece. And that's people are always going to compete about something. So let them compete to make beautiful art, beautiful songs, beautiful buildings, beautiful sculpture. That's all good. Write a beautiful book. That's what we want people competing for. Christianity inspires us. It says, you know, we are created in the image of God. Therefore, we too can be a creator. There too, we can try to understand God's creation. It inspired science. Real science comes from the Catholic Church, okay? Atheism destroys science. Atheism is fake science. All right, well, anyways, and I believe me, I know that based on studying it ever since I was a little kid. All right, since I was 18 years old. It's a long time ago. Okay, Roman Catholic Church. Okay, here's George Santayana making a quote. The Roman Catholic Church has much in common with Greek paganism. Christianity arose out of Greek theology and Old Testament morality. Greek theology predominated in Catholicism, whereas the Catholic and the Catholic Church has much in common with Greek paganism. Old Testament morality predominated in Protestantism. Yep. The Catholics had a Renaissance, the Protestants had a Reformation. Okay, so that's a good quote by Santayana. And I like all the community. Oh, one thing about the saints. Some people say, oh, well, Catholic Church is pagan. It worships saints. No, it doesn't worship saints. People pray to a saint. And what praying to a saint is like, it's sort of like you're saying, hey, could you please help me out? Ask God if you can do me a favor. All right. And so the idea is that you're asking a saint to intercede for you. Uh, for example, my mom used to play, pray to St. Jude, the patron saint of hopeless causes. You know, we had a little baby in our family that was very sick. And my mother had a little statue of St. Jude, and she'd pray, oh, please pray to God and ask him to save this baby. And she actually did save the baby. But what I'm trying to say is, the idea is that if you pray to the saint and you don't get what you want, you don't get your favor granted, you say to yourself, well, maybe I can pray to another saint. There's still hope. On the other hand, if you pray to God and, you're, and your request for a favor is rejected, you sort of feel hopeless that, uh-oh, you know, big God, he, bought, he said no, so I'm screwed. Okay, one of the points I want to make is, you know, Christianity's been doing good things for a long time. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas, he was, you know, sort of the leader of the syncretic movement of incorporating the philosophy, theory, and knowledge of Aristotle from the ancient Greeks into the educational process of, of Catholics, all right? And it was a great thing, okay? And Ayn Rand will tell you, the greatest philosopher who ever lived is Aristotle. A lot of people think he's the smartest person who ever lived. And Ayn Rand will tell you, wherever Aristotle's teaching was promoted, there was an improvement in society. And that's true. Aristotle really is one of the all-time greatest geniuses. And, you know, I love the fact that Thomas Aquinas sort of helped incorporate Aristotelianism into the education of the Europeans. And what that led to was a movement called scholasticism. And then scholasticism is what led to the Renaissance, okay? And so it's all, it's a great thing. I actually like uh, Thomas Aquinas a lot. I think I'm actually a little bit like him myself in, in the sense of trying to see how the good from one area can be combined with the good from another area rather than saying it only has to be one way. Like I like the Augustinians, and, and remember Luther was an Augustinian monk, they were influenced much more from the ancient Greeks by Plato. And the Augustinian way of looking at things was very narrow. 
and it has less respect for the individual. It sort of says there's no free will, and then you get into all this predestinationism and Calvinism and all this BS, whereas Aristotle's more like, look, we can use our wisdom, we can use our mind, we have a mind, it's a great thing, let's use it. Okay, um, here's a painting of Dante's Divine Comedy. Um, this painting was made in 1465, but you know Dante wrote this in the 1300s, and the sort of the worldview of Catholicism, it was all beautiful and clear, and you're position in the world was clear and what you had to do you know if you sin too much and you don't repent you end up in hell if you uh make a few minor mistakes you might get stuck in purgatory for a while your goal is to end up in heaven it was a clear logical system to life um and the afterlife even and it's rather beautiful and then here's a guy who i really like people have criticized pope julius i think he's a great guy okay I'll, why do i say this well, Pope Julius did have some children, okay? Some people would say maybe he even had syphilis. I don't know if he did or not. But what I like about him is he tried to maintain the Vatican. He tried to protect it from other invaders. And he also commissioned uh, the greatest art in the history of the world. So people say, well, what was the point of all that indulgence money? Well, the major part of it was Pope Julius trying to make the Vatican more beautiful, okay? And he was doing that for the benefit of the whole world. The whole world would travel to Rome. And he set the standards for magnificent architecture, sculpture, and um, painting. And, you know, here's a painting by Perugino about uh, the keys to heaven being given from, let me get my picture out here, the keys to heaven being given from Christ to St. Peter. And so the church did have a mandate based on Christian history for putting itself in the center of the Catholic religion. And the Catholic religion existed for a long time before um, before the Bible was even done. I think the Catholic Church, you know, Jesus died about 33 uh, A.D., and then the Bible didn't get into widespread, you know, official confirmation, gosh, until around Constantine or so. Uh, so it was a long time later before they even had a Bible, all right? And then the Bible was selected and confirmed by the Catholic Church, and that's going to come up because Luther would say, oh, sola scriptura, only scripture. You know, and it's like, well, hold on, pal. The, the Catholic Church is the one pretty much who chose what goes into the Bible, okay? So he used it as a tool against the Catholic Church. I'm going to get into that in just a moment. Oh, but uh, here's actually a quote that, that basically confirms what I just said. And also I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church. You know, Peter, Pedro, sort of like means stone and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So anyways, there's a mandate for the Catholic Church that comes right out of the Bible. Okay, Luther says he wants to go by the Bible, but then Luther says, sola fide, sola, only faith, sola gratia, only grace. I'll explain what that means in a moment, but sola fide, only faith is what is necessary for salvation. That's a major contradiction in the rest of the Bible. Everybody can point out James where there's a direct uh, contradiction where it says you, you don't go to heaven by faith alone. There's also works. But, you know, the necessity and the benefit of works, that's stated in multiple other parts of the Bible. Okay, like Matthew 5.16, for example. Okay, and then what I say, here's some of the great things that the Catholic Church was doing. They had Michelangelo painting the origin of the earth. Okay, it's pretty useful for, to have that clarified for people. The creation of Adam. Adam, this is the most important painting ever made in the history of the world. Basically, it says man is created in the image of God. Therefore, he is partly divine as well, of, of course, as being part beast. Therefore, he's entitled to natural rights. Okay, there's something special about him. He's different than all the animals. He should have the right to free speech. He, she should have the right to privacy. He should have the right to property. He should have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, and if you don't have that, what you end up with is the ruler of any place, like the Ro old Roman Empire. They declare themselves gods. And whatever they say goes. And just like, you know, England, when it was a big empire, you know, brutalizing the people of India, brutalizing the people of Ireland, they said, you know, basically, you know, atheistic Darwinism, might is right, whatever we say goes. All right? That's a big deal. Everything in civilization turns on that painting and the, the issue discussed in there. Okay, and then here's a little more about Ayn Rand. And I love Ayn Rand. And people say, oh, Ayn Rand was an atheist. I don't really think she was. I think she was a closet Catholic. And I say that based on having read a lot of her stuff. Because I know she'll directly contradict that, but then she'll say a hundred things that support it. Here's just real quick, Ayn Rand on Aristotle. If there is a philosophical atlas 
who carries the whole of Western civilization on his shoulders. It is Aristotle. So here's Aristotle right here, pointing down. Plato's pointing up to the heavens. He's all into this uh, mysticism, if you will. Aristotle is, you know, is a biologist, really. He's sort of very down-to-earth, as well as a philosopher. Uh, so Ayn Rand continues, Whatever intellectual progress men have achieved rests on his achievements. Aristotle may be regarded as the cultural barometer of the Western world, of Western history. Wherever his influence has dominated the scene, it has paved the way for one of history's brilliant eras. Wherever it fell, so did mankind. Aristotle is the father of individualism. Ayn Rand. Magnificent. Okay, and Ayn Rand also said, um, the smallest minority is the individual. If you respect individual rights, then everybody's better off. Okay. Um, this is the magnificent painting by Raphael, again commissioned by Pope Julius, called the School of Athens, okay, 1511. Okay, it's a masterpiece. It's magnificent. Okay, so what do I love about this painting? It captures the architecture of Rome, the statuary of Greece. Here's Socrates debating with the students, probably Alcibiades and whatnot. Um, and you got all these other famous uh, scholars from the, especially from ancient Greece. Magnificent. There's Michelangelo right there too. Raphael saw the painting of Michelangelo. It was just so extraordinary. It was amazing. You know, he's the greatest sculptor who ever lived, and he's one of the greatest painters who ever lived. You know, he's the greatest creative artist in terms of painting and sculpture overall that ever lived. Awesome. He's from Florence. Raphael, of course, is from Urbino. Raphael de Urbino. Okay, and here's just more great paintings, you know. Uh, Michael, uh, Mona Lisa, to me, is by Leonardo da Vinci. is a fat lady, okay, and I kind of laughed that. You know, low-fat vegan diet converts a woman from being a Mona Lisa fat into being uh, like the birth of Venus. This one was painted by Sandro Botticelli. Sandro Botticelli was a favorite artist of the Medici, commissioned by the Pope as well to paint. And the Medici were the Pope's bankers. So what I'm trying to say is, this is Aristotelian Christianity leading to the Renaissance. This magnificent work, this open-mindedness, this appreciation for the scholars of ancient Rome and of ancient Greece, of course. And it's beautiful. And this is what mankind should be doing. Mankind should be syncretic. Syncretic means that you learn from past cultures and you incorporate what you can learn from them and then you add your own new stuff to it too and everything just keeps getting better and better. Here's another magnificent painting by Sandro Botticelli, 1493. Okay, this is the kind of stuff that the Vatican supported. So what I'm saying is a lot of that indulgence money, it went to a very good cause to create the greatest art in the history of the world. That's a useful thing, showing mankind what he can aspire to, and all the Renaissance artists all competing to make better paintings in their churches. They're magnificent. Okay, here's another painting by Sandro Botticelli, The Annunciation. Angel Gabriel comes to Mary and lets her know that she will be the mother of the Christ child. Okay, it's just beautiful. Okay, and all these paintings I'm showing you, these were all things commissioned and around at the time of Pope Julius and Martin Luther. Okay, The Wedding of the Virgin by Raphael. Okay, telling the story of the life of Christ. Married to St. Joseph. Okay, and here's just one of uh, Fra Filippo Lippe's um, nativity scenes with Madonna and child, the baby, the Christ child. And you see the Trinity again with Christ, Jesu Christu, the Holy Spirit symbolized by the dove, and God the Father as well. And they're just beautiful. And this is in 1459, okay? <laughs> and he's a fry, he's a father, okay? He's a religious guy too. All right, and here's, here's a painting. I just love this painting, the Sistine Madonna and Child. This one's also by Raphael, done in 1512. That's Pope Sixtus. You know, the Sistine Chapel was named after him, Pope Sixtus. He was the uncle of uh, Pope Julius, okay, the Rovereri family, and it's magnificent, okay? I mean, it just symbolizes Catholicism and Christianity, the love of the family, the love of the baby, okay? And these little pooty angels are pretty famous. Van Halen has them on one of its uh, rock and roll album covers. All right, but... You, you, you sense Christianity right in this painting. Love of family. Um, you know, they're all helping each other. It's, it's beautiful. It's good. It's right. It's how humans should be. Okay, just another magnificent painting. I'm just showing you. I'm, what I'm trying to make the point of is the church, yes, it needed reform. Yes, there were corruption and problems in the church. But the church was doing magnificent things. It was promoting the best music ever in the history of the world. The best painting in the history of the world, the best sculpture in the history of the world, the best architecture in the history of the world, okay? It was doing a lot of good things, and it had great scholarly writers there as well. Okay, here's another, uh, you know, The Holy Family. This one is by Michelangelo. As you can see, he was an extraordinary artist as well, and his 
perspective, the three dimensionality of his painting. And here's the Pieta, you know, the Christ has just come down from the cross and he's with his Mary is weeping. And it's just so perfect. It's more than transcendent, it's sublime. It's the greatest sculpture ever made. Um, and you see that and you're like, how could a, even a human make something so beautiful, so perfect, so good? And it's inspiring. You know, any young sculptor sees that and they're like, wow, I want to be a sculptor. Okay, it's, it's, that's good that mankind does this. That's good that we want to imitate the great achievements and all of us improve and the ethics of it are right. And actually, let me go back to that real quick because there's, there's a little more to this. Michelangelo, you know, his mother died when he was about seven years old and he's very sad, of course. He lost his mother. And so in a sense, you know, she's almost like bigger than Christ in size. It's Michelangelo, you know, looking up to his mother. Okay, it's just beautiful. The mother he loved and missed. So Christianity is full of that loving, thoughtful, kindness between people and relationships. It's great. Okay, um, here is, because by the way, I think science uh, supports Christianity. And, and I know more science than just about anybody. I, stu I was a student, A plus student in evolutionary biology at Stanford. And I can tell you, I've read all that stuff. Nobody knows how the origin of life came from. And the best explanation is it came from God, okay? James Tour is the best scientist on the subject. People who tell you otherwise don't know what they're talking about. I like Nick Lane. I think he's the best of the, you know, the science, so-called atheistic versions of Origin of Life. But he's, you know, kind of Mickey Mouse compared to James Tour. Okay, the the God-based worldview, intelligent design. Another thing I liked about Christianity um, and Catholicism was they had all the pilgrimages. And here's a pilgrimage on the way to Canterbury. There's a Lady of Bath right there. You know, Geoffrey Chaucer's uh, stuff. Okay, Juan de Aprio with the Shorter Sota. Okay. All right, so anyways, Catholicism, Christianity in general, Catholicism in particular, is always generating beautiful paintings and stories and art. Um, and there's also life in it. There's laughter and fun and jokes and stories. It's pleasant. It's upbeat. Unlike Protestantism, so Christianity, Catholicism a lot of times pulls people towards it by its beauty, the beauty of its song, the beauty of its art, the beauty of its sculpture, the beauty of its painting, its, its stories, its jokes, whereas Protestant largely focuses on you would better behave or you're going to burn in hell. So it's kind of like a downer in comparison, and it's bleak, you know, getting rid of all the paintings. All right, and this is also an idea of uh, St. Paul. This is St. Paul preaching in Athens at the Areopagus by Raphael. And again, that's the kind of thing the Vatican was supporting, an appreciation for Greek culture, and an appreciation for, you know, the syncretic nature of it. So here's 1 Corinthians by St. Paul. If I speak in tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that could move mountains but have not love, then I am nothing. This, by the way, is a direct contradiction to Martin Luther. This is, James said you have to have good works in order to be saved. And what the first Corinthians here, uh, uh, chapter 13, what it's saying is that you don't even just have to have faith in good works. You also have to have love, okay? So love and faith leading to good works, fine, but you need these things, the love and the good works. Uh, faith alone, sola de fide, is wrong. It's not even just wrong emotionally in human metaphysics. It's wrong scripturally, okay? And now, like I said, I'm not going to fuss about dogmatics, but I'm just trying to point out that Luther would try to say that he's right and everyone else is wrong about dogmatics. And by the way, back in those days, not many people had a Bible because the Bible was so expensive. Printing was just coming into play that, you know, not hardly anyone could afford it and hardly anyone could read and hardly anyone could read in Latin or Greek and other languages. So what I'm saying is there weren't that many scholars around to argue with Luther when Luther would say something of the Bible. Lots of the preachers and stuff had not read the Bible themselves. Okay, so St. Paul continues, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it does rejoice with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. For we know now in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. What I now know in part, then I shall know fully. So now abide in these three, faith, 
hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Okay, so that's a pretty big emphasis on love. And these, are, by the way, are the three colors of the Catholic Church. White for faith, green for hope, and red for love. All right, so those are pretty good values. All right, so now a little more of the theory behind the book and behind the differences between Catholicism and, and Protestant. By the way, I wish they would all be joined together and they'd all get along. I could care less what some priest says about whether or not the communion wafer is literal or metaphorical in its symbolization of the body of Christ, okay? Who cares? Why argue about these minor things, okay? And I've gone through tons of Bible commentary and stuff. There's all kinds of stuff about, you know, mistranslations. One, you know, like, for example, the King James Version of the Bible. Well, King James... Uh, did the Bible that way. Here, I got my own copy. Here's my copy of King James Version of the Bible, by the way. Okay, you can see I got a ton of posts in it. I've read a lot of stuff in here. And King James, you know, had it translated in a way to promote his own authority so he could appoint all the bishops, bishops and have more control. Okay, and there's always a little bit of that in the different translations. So what I'm trying to say is, I don't. the main points don't change, you know. Christ emphasizing forgiveness, okay. Um, love thy neighbor and all that. Be nice to each other. That stuff doesn't change, but there's little minor, minor technical details, and there's some stuff of the Old Testament, too. I'm not going to get into all that right now. So what I'm trying to say is I don't really think dogmatism is good. I think it's totally overrated and a big waste of time, and it doesn't help people. Other things that led to the Protestant Reformation is the rulers got to take over the church, which they wanted. Instead of having the, the, the tithing sent out to Rome, they get to keep it for themselves. And they stole all the land of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church owned tons of land. So they just closed the Catholic monasteries and convents and stole all their land. So it was a big ripoff, and they didn't want to give that land back. Okay, uh, Like I said, Catholicism provided a nice community system for society with all its sacraments, with all its holidays, its feast days. Okay, um, here's some other things. Here's a good quote by Jacques Berzon. He's a real bright guy. He wrote the book From Dawn to Decadence, and he said, what Marx and Lenin were to communism, Luther and Calvin were to Protestantism, <laughs> which is about right, okay? Uh, the Reformation broke apart Christendom. Secular rulers took over the Protestant church, and they were usually far, far, far less holy than the popes. Okay, here's a good line. This is by Brad Gregory. He's a Reformation scholar. He has an entire course on the Reformation. I went through it years ago, and I remembered it being good, and I watched some more of his videos lately. And here's just some typical things Brad Gregory says. Luther used sola fide, faith alone, to say that works were not important. And this led to a loss of motivation on the part of the Protestants to perform good works. They're a lot less charitable than Catholics are. And it directly contradicts the Bible, especially James on works and Corinthians on love. And it actually contradicts it in other places, the gospel. Not some obscure book of James, but the gospel, okay? You know, right in the center of the heart of the Bible. Okay, but that was the point. By saying faith alone, Luther was saying you don't need the church, okay? And he's also saying sola scriptura, by scripture alone should we make our religious decision. And again, he was saying that the organized church was irrelevant. And that was pretty much a unique arguing path that Luther took that enabled him to sort of stand up to the church, if you will. But what really protected Luther was that the princes, like Frederick, protected him, okay? If it hadn't been for that, Luther would have been burned as a heretic, okay? And I realize that's a cruel thing to say, burned as a heretic. But that's just what would have happened, just like Jan Hus had been burned as a heretic, just like many of the supporters of Luther were burned as heretics, Ulrich, for example. Okay, um, before the Reformation, all of Western European society was united around the Catholic Church. And that's what religion means. It means relegare, legare meaning like to ligate in Latin, to tie the people together. Um, but once you had the Reformation, there were sustained disagreements that could not be reconciled by the theologians. Um, and that led to the secular authorities taking over and instituting, you know, how things were going to be to some extent. And one of the things I thought was a bit of a joke as well is that, you know, most of the people are illiterate. So they hadn't read the Bible. They couldn't argue about scriptura. They could care less about any of these details. You know, Martin Luther had commented when he went out into the rural areas of Germany, no one even knew the Lord's Prayer, yet alone knew the Bible, okay? So how are they going to have a strong opinion on this sort of stuff? It was really, you know, a couple people at the top stirring up all this trouble. Um, let's see. So what Brad Gregory is basically saying, Luther wanted people to be more religious, but because of his behavior and his conduct, what ended up happening was that the secular rulers just took everything over to a large extent and the people became far less religious than they had been before. So that would have been the opposite of what Luther wanted. And like I said too, 
and this led to a civil war in Germany and 80,000 of the peasants, the people he's supposed to be sort of supporting and helping, you know, got bumped off by the princess. Okay, that's not a good outcome for Germany. Um, and he did a few good things. He, you know, he made the Bible into the vernacular language. He wrote his nice song and he let popes get, he let uh, priests get married. I thought that was all good. A um, couple other things. What are some of the other differences, things that are relevant? Um, the Catholic Church worships, it doesn't worship, it prays to the saints and it prays to the Virgin Mary. And everybody likes that, okay? You know, the Virgin Mary is like the symbol of motherhood, okay? The symbol, you know, like I read you 1 Corinthians. What does that sound like? It sounds like the love of a mother, okay? Fathers love their kids too, but dad's out working, okay? He's not around at home. Mama is the one with that little baby, trying to keep that baby healthy, alive, and doing well. Um, Catholic, much better at painting and sculpture. You know, other than that little, you know, Victorian Renaissance thing with the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, then the followers of it, like Edmund Leighton. And yeah, they were magnificent. I love those painters. But I'm just saying, in general, Catholics are better, more creative. Um, Michelangelo, for example, was a member of the Franciscans. They should have made Lutheran an order of the Catholic Church, you know, the Lutherans, and that, that would have been the smart thing to do. Everybody would have been better off. They should have just said, okay, Luther, you're a hothead. We forgive you. Have your own order and try not to be too much of a pain in the butt. Okay, um, the rejection of the Pope is considered by some people as the biggest difference between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. I still think the, the Church needs its own authority, though, because... If you have the secular ruler in charge, they're just going to do whatever they want and they're going to ignore the church. When there's an alternative significant ruler, you have a third party, you have something to appeal to. If you get rid of the church and society, then the secular ruler, whatever say they go, might is right and you just have to avail, you just become like a slave, okay? Uh, when you've got a third party religion you can appeal to, then there's you know a moralistic high ground that can help an individual who's not popular in society, okay? And believe me, I know what that's like. I, I, you know, my father's from Ireland. The Irish totally got screwed by the Protestant uh, English, okay. And then my mother's from Puerto Rico, okay. And so nobody cares about Puerto Ricans. People tend to hate Puerto Ricans. Think they're a bunch of dumb jerks who beep their horns loud and have their flag out the window. And even worse, you know, you say, well, if you're a minority, well, then you know, if you're stupid, you'll you'll get kind of pushed along. But if you're smart like me, then you get ignored, okay. Nobody ever wants to talk to me. Um, all these Hispanic societies, not a single one of them ever contacts me, ever. And I've contacted a bunch of them. They don't. That's kind of another whole separate topic. I'm getting on a separate topic there. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is, if you are from an outside group, like I certainly am in multiple ways, you want a third-party religion that you can appeal to. Because if the secular ruler doesn't like you, they'll just abuse you and whatever group you're from, and you'll have no other appeal. You'll have nothing to appeal to. You're just screwed. And you better move out of there as fast as you can because you are screwed. And that's just how it is in most places if you're not part of the majority power group. Okay, um, Catholic Church goes back to Christ. Protestants are all started by, you know, men, you know, hundreds, thousands of years later. Catholics began, began modern music, but you got to give the Protestants credit. They were awesome, fantastic at it, okay? The Lutheranism uh, in Germany, you know, an outgrowth of that was the Baroque music movement with Bach and Handel, two of the greatest composers who ever lived. Of course, Catholicism led to the modern scientific method of hypothesis, uh, empirical experiment, etc. Uh, Christ, the saints, and art are some of the greatest apologetics for our faith. Yes. Uh, like I said, Protestantism is bleak. No paintings or sculpture in their church. They don't have any saints. They don't, they don't pray to Virgin Mary. Come on. Um, here's a quote from Matthew, Matthew 5, 16, chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. Okay, that they may see your good works. So that's right from the gospel according to Matthew, right there in the gospel contradicting Luther. Okay, so I find it hard to believe that Luther could miss that. Okay, it's not just one spot, it's in a bunch of spots. And I, I previously done a video about, like, during Christmas time, Christianity is the light of the world, okay? For everyone else, it's just a cold, bleak winter. But when you got Christmas... You got all the Christmas lights in, in, in front of the houses, the Christmas trees, the gifts, the homecomings. It takes something cold and bleak and miserable. Otherwise, you would call Christmas break. You would call it just winter break. Okay, what kind of nonsense BS is that? That's depressing versus Christmas break is the highlight of the year. So it takes what would have been the worst time of the year and makes it the best time of the year. And that's what Christianity does to life. Okay, uh, let's see. What else? 
what else did Luther do besides smashing sculpture and paintings? And Luther wasn't as bad as the other ones, but he couldn't control them. And based on his teachings, Sola Scriptura and the way they saw things, that's what they did. They just also they broke the stained glass windows in the church, threw the Celtic crosses into the sea. They would hang the Catholic priests. They would R.A.P.E. the nuns. Um, Protestantism takes the fun out of Christianity. And here's a great quote by Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher. He says, The Protestant Reformation was one of the most colossal failures in history. Colossal failures in history. It threw overboard what makes the church tolerable, even gracious, its aesthetic appeal, but it kept its barbarous theology. Yeah, you end up with people like Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, all this stuff from Protestantism. You end up with books like The Scarlet Letter, okay? kind of miserable and Carl Jung had noticed too the bleakness of Protestantism um, and how it keeps breaking up now into like 30,000 different groups okay we're almost done here let's see okay here's uh, John Henry Newman the Cardinal in um, in England in the 1800s who became a saint later on he says to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant yeah if you really study the history of Christianity you'll be a Catholic you'll either be a Catholic or you won't be a Christian okay and if you have any sense of human behavior, metaphysics, God, and what is good, you'll want to become a Catholic, okay? Okay, um, turn away. I've studied Catholicism in tremendous detail and Christianity in general in tremendous detail as well as history and art. I have a pretty boring life. I read and study a lot, okay? And that goes back to since I was 18 years old. And it's just beautiful, okay? You look at most of the great achievements of mankind. They've come out of Christianity, all right? And here's what um, uh, Newman says. He says, if you turn away from Catholicism, to whom will you go? It is your only chance of peace and assurance in this turbulent, changing world. In the long run, it will be found that either the Catholic religion is verily and indeed the coming in of the unseen world into this, or that there is nothing real in any of our notions as to whence we come and whither we are going. If you unlearn Catholicism, you become Protestant. And then Unitarian, Deist, Pantheist, Skeptic, in a dreadful but infallible succession. God has created me to do some definite service. I shall do good. I shall do his work. I shall be a preacher of truth. He wrote a hymn, uh, John Henry Newman was well called, Lead Kindly Light, Lead Kindly Light. That's a good one. Lead thou me on, the night is dark, and I am far from home. Lead thou me on, keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step is enough for me. I can relate to that big time. John Henry Newman, 1849. All right, and so this is sort of like taking us to the modern era. And this is the course of Empire Paintings by Thomas Cole, some of the greatest. He's like one of the greatest story painters of all time. Him and Michelangelo, of course. And this is Consummation of Empire. And this is sort of what I see like America in the 1970s. This is what I see Rome you know, around 1500, 1510, with Michel 1520, even with Michelangelo, Raphael, and the other great artists there. And um, things are great. Yeah, there's a little bit of decadence and corruption, but things are great. You know, people are able to live their life in their freedom and pursue their own abilities. And here's what we're trending into. And this is also based on the philosophy, too, of history, cultural cycles, like a Gian Battista Vico. Okay, that the cultural societies, the people would build themselves up from you know the pioneer days, and then they're hyper religious and good and brave, and then they become a little more scholarly. They start to refute their ancient ways, and then they end up with this kind of stuff with an open, you know what, down south and a flood of uh, aliens. Okay, and society just goes. Psh! All right, and then they lose their religion and they destroy their old religious houses and they burn down their churches. It's like, think about Russia in the 1900s. And then they lose their freedom and they end up in slavery. So hopefully we're not headed into that, but it certainly looks like we are. And, you know, when that time comes, you know, they'll get rid of the scholars like myself. But until that time comes, I will try to help the proles. And uh, hopefully it's not going to end up in this. The return to slavery. I hope not. So anyways, Martin Luther, I think, kind of led to this break apart of religious society, even though he didn't mean to, he did, the secularism. And secularism, we're either going to recover from it or we're going to end up in this type of thing. So hopefully things will get better. Anyways, I hope that was interesting and useful to you.